Jensen, he, him, his. I am a resident playwright with Spectrum Theater Ensemble, and I am really excited to be hosting this panel um, on the intersectionality between LGBTQ plus issues and disability. I am joined here by two um, amazing, amazing people slash artists slash humans. Um, so before we dive into our conversation, I want to um, give them the chance to introduce themselves and tell y'all a little bit about themselves. So, um, so Damon, would you like to go first? Sure thing. Uh, the name you see there is my Facebook handle, but uh, my name is Damon Neighbors, and I am from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I was diagnosed late, um, but since then I have been increasing my advocacy. I uh, have planned two autistic-led symposiums here in the South. Uh, I formed the Chattanooga Neurodiversity Alliance to educate about neurodiversity in the Deep South. And uh, I also do speaking engagements and the focus of my advocacy is um, the intersection of queerness, transness, and uh, discussing gender and dating on the spectrum, as well as our vulnerabilities. Um, I also do a lot of uh, talking about um, the difficulties we face in institutions like uh, jails and rehabs. So thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us, uh, Haley. Hi, uh, my name is Haley St. James. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am a Boston born, um, currently based in Boston, but normally, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I would be in New York City. Um, I, am a, I am also like Dave, I am a playwright. Um, I mostly uh, write about uh, myself and my communities to make sure they're represented truthfully. Um, so I mostly write neurodivergent, queer, I write, I write characters that you know live truthful lives. I write characters that I hope other people who are like me can see themselves in. Um, I had a, a reading with um, Pride Plays uh, last summer um, 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 through New York, uh, in New York. Um, it was virtual, it was an industry reading of uh, my play for Leonore or Companions, which is a, a queer autistic um, love story, um, magical realism. Uh, I mostly just, I've been spending most of the pandemic just writing and honing my craft. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Great. Well, we are really thrilled to have both of you here. So um, the first um, kind of jumping off point or question that I want to pose is um, in terms of uh, like media presenta representation of um, uh, either neurodivergent or disabled um, people, um, a lot of the narratives like tend to fo focus almost exclusively on straight white men. Um, I can only think of a few where um, queerness plays a part into it, like spe Netflix, uh, Netflix's a special, for example, which is very good if you haven't watched it. But then you have shows like um, The Good Doctor and Atypical where it's centered on, on like straight white men. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious why, um, as a, as a queer folk, why do you both think this has been the dominant central narrative in the media for so long, despite statistics reporting that neurodivergent people especially are likelier to identify as LGBTQ+. Plus? Hmm. And it's kind of a big question we're diving right in here. I feel right like it's, here. it's pretty simple that we live in a uh, incredibly patriarchal, cishet, white society. Um, and unfortunately, Unfortunately, they dictate a lot of, you know, the media and what we see in the media and what's presented to the population. And unfortunately, since so much of the science for so long had, you know, always just focused on the cishet white male people with the diagnoses, that's what we ended up seeing in the media. And unfortunately, since so much of it is, you know, based on that very small percentage of the population as opposed to the entire autistic queer population or just autistic population in general they mostly just get stereotyped and whatever representation we get in the media so much of it unfortunately is the same stereotypes of you know the man child or the you know the savant it's like the big two that we always get 
which is very annoying. I don't watch The Good Doctor or Atypical because I know that their representation of people with autism is will set me off. I did like grow up watching a lot of The Big Bang Theory. Um, even though Sheldon and Amy are not like canonically autistic, they were the closest thing to representation that I had on TV growing up as you know in, as a teenager, really. Um, so I'm so grateful for that show, even though. I don't really love the writing on the show. Those two characters were the most consistently well-written, I thought, and still pretty much, like, I mean, they're not perfect. I will not, like, defend them outright, but I still, like, appreciate them as, like, a comfort watch. But, yeah, unfortunately, it's just, you know, the patriarchy, really. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Um, my first impressions of seeing people like me on screen um, were a little earlier. It was, um, and far more insultingly stereotypical it was things like um steve urkel oh. and i knew that i had things in common with him and that i was a stereotype and it's um and, and that happens when you're queer too uh before you know there was ellen and everything you would just see paul lind in the hollywood squares and you go hmm you know um yeah other damaging images in the media that I've seen um, were on Saturday Night Live. They did mm -hmm. Larry the Effeminate Heterosexual uh, was a running uh, skit on SNL as was um, It's Pat. It's Pat. Yeah, yeah. Which was not only a cruel stereotype of non-binary non people, it was uh, also a cruel stereotype of uh, autistic people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that whole nerdy kind of androgynous yes. um, thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was basing things on growing up. And it, it wasn't until, you know, I was completely full grown and already a blackout drunk that like, um, I first heard the term non-binary and it was mm -hmm. such a relief because I finally had a word. I was always like, I don't fit either. I don't know what's going on, you know? Um, but it was such a relief to finally uh, mm -hmm. see younger generations leading the way on defining. Yeah. I, uh, other than just L's and L's and G's. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny. I never, I, it's funny because I watched a lot of like, like clips from like Urkel as a kid because I enjoyed Julia White because I had a Sonic the Hedgehog phase when I was in middle school. So like, I was like, oh, Julia White versus Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm going to watch a bunch of Urkel stuff. And I was like, I didn't, I never really caught on that Urkel was, a, you know, an autistic like stereotype. I just thought, you know, he's like, you know, the, the classic nerd character. But the more I do think about it, so much of the media that depends nerd characters does have an overlap with autistic characters. As I said, the Big Bang Theory. Um, it's funny because for me, when I don't think like I didn't like fully realize I was non-binary until only about four years ago, really, um, even maybe a little bit before then. But recently I've been like thinking about things or like actors that I really like hyper fixated on growing up. And like the like um recently because it's been twenty years since Spy Kids came out, and I didn't. And when I was in like high school, I was obsessed with Alan Cumming. Because I was like, oh, he's so delightful and, you know, flamboyant and, and androgynous. And, like, he's, you know, this fabulous Scottish imp man. I love him. He's amazing. I saw him on Broadway and a bunch of things. And I thought he was super cool. But I didn't really think of anything about it in terms of, like, gender. I was like, oh, I just think he's neat. And then when I graduated high school, during my first gap year, um, I saw um, the off-Broadway uh, In the Tent production of Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. And um, that was the first time I ever saw Lucas Steele, who played Anatole. Um, and I had never seen this person before. And he walks in, and he's this beautiful, androgynous, alien-looking blonde boy. And I'm like, who are you? I will follow you anywhere. And that was the first time I really ever felt gender envy. So, mm. you know, as the years went on and Great Comet moved to Broadway, and I saw it a bunch. And I was like, I'm going to cosplay Anatole. I want to cosplay Anatole. Anatole just is super cool. I love Lucas Steele. He's so cool. And when I started really doing that, I was like, wait a second. Like, this feels right. Like, I don't know. There's just something about him that just feels correct for me. I don't know. Like, he became a bit of a muse. But then he said in an interview that he was trying to channel, like, David Bowie's sort of androgyny and, like, transcending gender. I'm like, oh, transcending gender? I really like that. I, I feel that. That's how I feel, I think. That's how I 
feel. And I had to juggle with that for a while. Cause I was like, am I, am I non-binary? I don't know. Am I like demi non-binary? So like, like most of 2017, like I'm demi non-binary. Like you can use they, them pronouns for me sometimes. Like I'll tell you when I feel like it. But then by 2018, I was like, no, like this is me. I'm non-binary. I transcend gender. Thanks Lucas Steele. Um, and I got to tell Lucas last um, January, um, he was in a show off Broadway that I saw a lot right before the shutdown. And I was just really grateful I could tell him that he was like the they sort of, I saw him and I was like, yeah, I realized. And I'm just really grateful for that. But I can't really think of like, you know, queer, you know, non-binary like rep. I wasn't really, didn't really get to see it a lot as a child. I just sort of imprinted on actors who they gave me those vibes. Even though they may not even be non-binary, I just like, wow, I feel that with myself. I don't know. Yeah, I often, sorry, Damon. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, I just thought of a few things. Um, I have always kind of known I was non-binary, but didn't really understand the full extent of what mm-hmm. that meant mm-hmm. until mm-hmm. later on after I had gotten my autism diagnosis mm-hmm. and I had begun the process of unmasking 40 years mm. yeah. of persona. Mm. Um, I was, I bought pink everything and was hyper femme, um, except when I couldn't stand it anymore and I would cut all my hair off. And um, a lot of that is because of uh, particularly disabled queer people are dependent on family and <laughs> you have to be a certain way, um, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, I come from a part of the country uh, that especially in my early teen and teen years was having a a toxic discourse Mm -hmm. about um, LGBTQ people and it's never really let up, uh, Mm -hmm. but the gender roles were very demarcated and, that is so much a part of my mask, being feminine and being neurotypical, um, that uh, it was only when I processed my autism, I was able to go, okay, well, that doesn't really explain everything I've been going through. I've been going through a lot of things and, uh, you know, um, self-harm and eating disorders and substance abuse and just never being able to work and um, it it was always hard to know whether people were being nasty to me because I'm odd or because I'm gender non-conforming and it was just it didn't matter how femme I dressed it came through you know Uh, and other queer people would just look at me and go uh, you know because I I was dating men and I still do and that's very confusing Mm-hmm. I um I, going on with you <laughs> I was diagnosed when I was very young but I wasn't aware of my I wasn't like made fully aware of my diagnosis until I was about 16 or so um so most of my life like I had the same psychologist um or psychiatrist really from like elementary school into like my first two years of college which I mean looking back was not really ideal considering I should have had one that had one ever you know between like you know elementary school then middle school then high school should have had one that grew and changed with me and I'll have the same one throughout because I was just under the assumption until I was 16 that I just had very, very high functioning ADHD. Um, and so, yeah, when I was in school, like for the most time, like I was kind of a bully to like, I wasn't even really sure if I really had like bullies or like people who like made fun of me. I mean, maybe one or two like I was definitely aware of, but mostly I was just kind of oblivious to everything because I was so bad at reading social cues that I just sort of assumed everybody thought I was fine or at least and now looking back like did people just tolerate me I not even fully aware and I didn't really fully start to unmask until I left for college the first time and I started to like not have to live with my parents and learn to live on my own and I was like because my senior year of high school I took AP psychology and that was when I was like wait a second yeah no I was like yeah autism I like I wanted I read up on it like you know in my textbooks like took out books I was like yeah yeah this completely tracks how did I not fully realize this sooner and then by the time I finally live on my own I'm in college I mean the first two years of college were awful and theater saved my life and I realized I was going to be a playwright not an actor and I became more comfortable in like being open about my labels and open about my autism and 
from there, I just have been a lot more just, I'm grateful that I don't really have to mask anymore. But at the same time, since the pandemic has happened, I finished college like literally a month before the pandemic started. I graduated. Um, it took me a few years to decide to transfer schools. So by the time I graduated and like I'm living on, I'm living in New York, I'm living, I'm finally doing what I love. I'm independent. And then boom, pandemic, I have to move back home in the middle of the summer. I immediately start regressing. And it's been really hard, but I'm just grateful that like, I mean, today we're literally recording on World Autism Day and it's been really, really cathartic to be able to just talk about the experience of being autistic and yeah. like not being afraid I, of having to mask. And I mean, granted, yeah. I, mean, I wish World Autism Day was every day because it should be. Yeah, I think you're you're getting at something really interesting, Haley, about how your relationship with both your queerness and your autism has kind of uh, evolved uh, mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. And that just gets me thinking a lot about um, like my relationship to uh, my own autism mm -hmm. and uh, my own queerness, because I was diagnosed, like you, I was diagnosed very young. And I, my, I knew about my diagnosis when I was very young, and it was kind of like portrayed to me as, as a defect of mine, mm. almost, or something to be overcome. So I kind of mm. framed my own story the way that everyone around me framed it as like this great story of triumph. But then when I got to college, like you, I also had a very, my undergrad experience was rough. My grad school experience was a lot better, but the first, especially the first year of undergrad, like mm -hmm. it was rough. Yep. And okay. I, um, I was just like, you know, I don't feel like I have overcome anything even at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of uh, representation, a lot of the narratives that, um, a lot of the autism narratives that I kind of, I guess, consumed or that I was, um, either present that was presented to me um, were stories of uh, parents who had to take care mm. of autistic children autism. and not really stories about um, the autistic characters themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And like on one hand, you know, those um, like Sarah Kerchak writes about this beautifully in her memoir where um, she, um, she and her mother are in Vegas and she's experiencing sensory overload and she has to like, she like her mother reaches out to touch her and she kind of like jerks away and um she has to go to a bathroom to calm down and mm -hmm. um she writes you know like the story of the mother of questioning if her child loves her can't bear her touch like that's the moving story that wins awards and it's valid but there's this whole other story going on mm. and it didn't really occur to me to be like I had to think about was this my parents struggle or was this my struggle because I was the one going through all of this <laughs> yeah. um that actually leads me to uh, my next question um I know we like to talk a lot about um like you know problematic portrayals mm -hmm. of autism and queerness in the media but I kind of want to shift to like what are some of the least problematic or best examples of uh, neurodivergent and or disabled LGBTQ representations you have seen in the media? I will start off with that. Um, it's slowly getting better. There's more of a, of a, like, I don't know, a zeitgeist, a consciousness mm -hmm. of uh, what neurodiversity is. And one of the portrayals I like the best are uh, Rue and Jules in uh, uh, Euphoria. Euphoria. Um, Euphoria. Uh, great show. Still and, need to watch it. But yeah, I love and, Zendaya and Hunter Schaefer. When they're introducing Jules' character, it is mm -hmm. about kind of her trans journey, but it also, she is described as having very specific autism symptoms, uh, mm -hmm. recurring thoughts. You, you can't you know, having trouble forming words. And um, with Rue, so many of her things might be attributable to something like bipolar disorder or something, but um, mm -hmm. she is very heavily coded for neurodivergency and they are both queer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a, it's a very touching relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And I just really enjoyed that representation. For me, um, 
it's it's kind of interesting because it kind of ties into my play that I wrote for Leonora or Companions. Uh, but there's a wonderful show um, on Freeform called Everything's Gonna Be Okay, um, mm. which is the first time that I one have seen an actually autistic actor play an autistic character, let alone multiple actually mm. autistic actors playing actually autistic characters. And um, so um, the show, um, if you don't know, is about um, an Australian guy played by Josh Thomas. Um, he's gay and he finds out his, um, his stepdad has uh, passed away and he has to move to America and take care of his stepsisters um, who are teenagers in high school. And um, one of them is, um, her name is um, Genevieve and she's, um, she's definitely coded as like having like some sort of anxiety or depression. Um, and she's wonderful, but um, her older sister is named uh, Matilda, and she's played by Kayla Cromer, who is actually autistic, and Matilda is autistic, and she's, you know, a teenager, and she's figuring out things about her sexuality for the first time, and throughout the course of the first season, she realizes that she likes girls, and there's another autistic girl in her uh, class at school named Drea, and they, they start, they fall in love, and it's really, really wholesome, and feels very awesome authentic and as someone who is a queer who is an autistic lesbian and who has been longing to see you know because I mean yeah there are some like autistic gay characters in things I can't really name it in my head but like in definitely plays for example Dave your wonderful play Light Switch um which I love so much um but seeing Matilda and Drea's relationship was the first time that I had felt completely seen by a television show, not only just because the characters, but the actors were also autistic. So it was extra authentic. And it's really mm. beautiful. And actually, they're doing a panel right now with Autism Society um, on Facebook about season two that obviously I can't be at right now, but hopefully it's good. And they talk more about Matilda and Andrea's relationship in season two, because I'm concerned, because I don't know, TV loves to do drama and be like, oh, wait, maybe that was just season one. Maybe they'll break up. I don't want them to break up. I love them. But that show, at that point, the only other autistic lesbians that I'd seen in the media was a play I'd written myself, which was for Leonora or Companions. And so when it got chosen by Pride Plays to be, you know, have a equity reading, they were like, okay, so you're going to be part of the casting process. Give us names. Who do you want in these roles? And I was immediately like, I want Kayla. I want Kayla or Lillian, who plays Drea. I want either of them has Nora, who is our autistic main character in Four Lean Our Companions. And I got to work with Lillian, which was incredible. And she was such a gift to work with. She was so wonderful. And, you know, she felt seen by my work, which was mm. all that really mattered to me more than anything. Like, oh, hey, I'm getting industry reading. That's super cool. No, I was getting an actual autistic actor to work on a piece about an actual autistic character that I'd put a year and a half of my life into writing. Like I wrote this play, most of it in college. Um, it wasn't my senior thesis piece, but it was a piece I spent most of my last year and a half of school working on and writing. I submitted it to the to the festival on a whim, so when I found out I got in, I was very overwhelmed. But the fact that I got to work with someone who is actually autistic, who's also playing an actual autistic character on a nationwide television show, it just it felt really, really, really good. And everything's going to be okay. It's such a wonderful show, and I'm really grateful that it's on TV and got a second season because so many things I love like rarely get you know renewed for things or like you know they're cult things but like this show is popular enough to get a second season and I'm really happy that it's normalizing not only autistic rep but queer rep, queer autistic rep which is so so important to me as I said your play is incredible play yeah, no I think it's um no I think you're um really tapping into something Haley about how um you are able to um create your own representation, which then allows other performers who have, who are at those intersections, that representation as well. So it's like you give them that gift and then they have that and like you're able to provide the representation that you want to see. I think that's really, really incredible. That kind of leads me, it's like my next question. So um, when uh, you are going about representing the perspective of uh, someone who is disabled, neurodivergent, um, and LGBTQ, um, like what goes into represent representing them from your own either autistic or advocacy practices? Well, um, I'm not a playwright and I don't create characters. Um, 
but there's a lot of things I would like to see. Um, I would like, gosh, it, in the Queen's Gambit, there is a trans character um, who is just the piano uh, music teacher at the mm -hmm. academy. And it was so good to see representation like that because it wasn't about her being trans, it was about her being the music teacher. And um, I would just like more uh, intersectional characters to be represented because it seems like when you're doing characterization in a show or a movie, uh, everybody is just kind of like, there's just one difference for each person, you know, and they're parceled out and uh, it doesn't ever express the complexity that is within an individual. Um, and I would just like to see more complex characters. And I think that's um, going to help a lot of us deal with our multiple things. Mm. I agree. Um, for me, when writing um, autistic characters, because so far I've written three autistic characters between my uh, two full length plays. Um, because um, in my other full length play, um, A God Awful Small Affair, it's not outright stated in the text, but it's definitely like, it's in the, um, it's in the character description and like, it can be pretty much inferred um, that uh, Luca, who is a non-binary stoner who is visited by the ghost of David Bowie is autistic. Um, their big hyper focus is David Bowie. Um, for me, like any of my characters who tend to have hyper fixation special interests, I do my own dramaturgy on my work so far anyway because I haven't gotten to work with professional dramaturgs yet so I do a lot of my own self dramaturgy and not only making sure that like the elements of uh, their autism are represented truthfully so like oh does this character stim does this character um like what's their hyperfixation or special interest um do they have like specific like texture things they have like you know sensory processing things um I really like put into consideration a lot of these things I take lots of elements from my fellow friends who are on the autism spectrum because I have friends of you know all places on the spectrum which is wonderful I mean neurodiv neurodivergency in general I'd say a, I'd say a solid 90 percent if not 99 percent of my friends are neurodivergent in some capacity um so I really take into consideration like oh has has have any of my characters explored this before no okay I'm gonna like you know really like I do a lot of I mean I like to research when I'm, I I want to make sure my characters are as truthful as possible and when it comes to their hyperfixation and special interests, I deep dive myself. I end up, mm. you know, gaining sometimes a new special interest or hyperfixation. Um, in Forley Nora or Companions, uh, Nora's special interest is the Oz books. Um, I myself had a massive special interest in the Oz books when I was in elementary school, middle school. Um, and then it came back to me when I was in college when I moved to New York and I could go to Books of Wonder, which is a children's bookstore that actually specializes in antique children's books. And the Oz books is like kind of like when they're flagship, like we print these on demand. So we have a lot of them and I could actually finish my collection after 14 years, which was very cool. Um, but, um, and for uh, God of a Small Affair, uh, Luca's obsession with David Bowie, for me, like, I mean, I always was aware of David Bowie and this ties into like the non-binary and you know gender stuff um being able to like really deep dive into david bowie and realize wow like it was like my muse in terms of you know kind of transcending gender and just doing art for art's sake and sort of just presenting you know as you know this you know it's david bowie kind of impossible to really describe because he's just that freaking cool um but really getting to deep dive into that and like channel my thoughts and feelings about you know becoming you know having a special interest in this person for the first time into this character who is also autistic. It's just, I, I love doing this with my, I love doing this as part of the research and the ending process of my plays. It's like my favorite thing, actually. It's harder to like write the actual script than it is to like sort of create my characters because the character stuff is just so natural for me because these characters are parts of me. And I just try to, as I say, I make these characters as truthful as possible. They're from my life. And as I said, I try to make my own representation. So I'm just, that's really all I do with my work. Um, so representation's like your own form of advocacy, yeah, really, you would say? Yeah, that's actually, yes, between that and like my constant, you know, sharing fellow autistic people's, you know, um, stuff on social media, um, you know, supporting other, trans, you know, autistic and, and queer and lots of overlap. Um, I know I went to your I went to your production at ASU, the virtual production. Um, 
I've, you. you know, I mean, it was wonderful. I was honored to be there. Um, I, I mean, I'm just trying to support as many fellow, you know, queer autistic creators as possible. There's a lot of overlap, especially in the circles of Twitter that I'm in. So it's, it's really nice to be able to support fellow queer autistic people. And that's really, yeah, my advocacy is supporting others, but also, you know, creating stuff, which is my own advocacy. Great. So um, Damon kind of already answered uh, this question, but um, uh, I'm curious what you both uh, kind of hope for disabled neurodivergent LGBTQ plus representation mm -hmm. in the future. I think not just in the media, but also in like real life in <laughs> general. Well, recently there was the big kerfuffle over Sia's movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, had to be yeah. neutral. No, we don't have to be. Don't have to be <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I actually, I just did an interview somewhere and they asked me like what they thought of that movie. I was so glad I had seen it because I could like go off on, go off about it and be like, yes, I've seen it so I can actually back up my opinion. This film oh, really is beep. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a, this is a no good things to say about Sia's music <laughs> zone. But uh, about that, it's just, um, I hope that uh, the industry learns a little bit about how badly it can go when you do not consult autistic mm. people when you're putting together an artistic endeavor, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it's just the most frustrating thing about advocacy for me is just, mm. um, you know, I was already having to go plenty of rounds with people to be heard just being female. And, mm -hmm. and then I came out as autistic. And, you know, now I'm trans masculine, non binary. And it's just like there's all these layers of trying to be heard. And mm -hmm. um, I think artists who are creating, especially drama and stories, um, that's just so many hurdles. And of course, I would love to see more actually autistic um, actors and producers mm -hmm. and camera crews, yep. you know? Uh, I think that would be amazing. Um, God. The best, the, honestly, the best nonfiction representation of autism I've seen in the past year is I Am Greta. Yes. yes. I still love need Greta. To see that. Um, that is wonderful. It, I haven't watched showed, it. Either. Yeah, it showed how we all struggle. And, um, but <laughs> that we also shouldn't be praised for doing things that, you know, regular people do, like going to a dance mm -hmm. or, or something like that. But we should be recognized for the things we are doing that are extraordinary, you know, but with respect to how much more difficult that is for us to pull off mm -hmm. in the first place. So that's what I would like to see. I'm absolutely here for all of that. Um, I want to plug a friend of of mine and uh, my friend uh, Emily who has cerebral palsy um she is in a movie that premiered at this year's um was it was it South by Southwest I won the South I won a screenplay award at South by Southwest last year even though it was like canceled but it, it's actually coming out fairly soon on digital um it's a movie called Best Summer Ever it's from a, a company called Azino Mountain Farm and they're super committed to having an entirely inclusive um integrated uh abled and disabled cast um and it's a movie musical um and the cast is a mix of, you know, a lot of disabled actors and abled actors. And it's, um, it looks really, really cute and wholesome and delightful. And like, there's actually, you know, disabled voices working behind the scenes, on the scenes, co-writing it, everything. Um, it's, I'm, I read a review that basically said, this is basically everything Sia wanted to make, but couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, yeah, that, that's exactly how I feel. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that movie because it's, it's going to be really nice to see like this such a big step uh, like it's you know I don't know how mainstream it's going to be but like I'm just really happy that this movie even is being made and is coming out it was it came, it, they filmed it in 2017 so it took them like years to like, find a mm. distributor like it was going around festivals and stuff and I'm so happy I finally got a distributor I'm very looking forward to that um but on top of that just in general like obviously more actually autistic you know autistic neurodivergent disabled characters in any sort of media everything really I mean and also just not even media like um I mean obviously like I would love to see 
you know, more, you know, autistic and queer people, you know, in our government. Um, um, I saw a thing, I can't remember, um, I think she's a um, senator from Delaware, um, and she's one of the first trans um, senators or representatives um, in Congress, which is super cool. Um, there's just a lot of, I mean, again, Mayor Pete is now, you know, he's Secretary of Transformation Pete, which is it's awesome. We have, we have a gay man in, like, major cabinet position, which is super great. Um, but obviously, like, it would be just really nice to see more openly queer and autistic people and disabled people, you know, um, running for office. Um, I, just I think, agree. I think it's, um, I hate it's that this country we, need, is... we need full representation in society, mm -hmm. you know, yep. legal representation. Legal representation. Mm -hmm. We need representation in mental health services. Mm -hmm. We need to support autistic and neurodivergent people who are having trouble in, in academia. Yeah. Um, I got a full scholarship to college, full ride, and I mm. did, I had trouble with the transition from high school to college, ended up losing that scholarship, and I have most of a special education degree, actually. That's mm. where I found out about Asperger's syndrome, as it was called then, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not until I was full grown and in grad school, mm. you know. Um, and it, I was just like, oh, that's it, you know. Um, but I wholly encourage um, people I know, people within my network and the advocacy community who aren't just doing advocacy work. My best friend is uh, a neurodivergent trans woman who is just about to graduate from law school and go do an internship in New York at the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights. And um, we're just really spitballing a lot of ideas mm -hmm. um about how to make things better in general mm -hmm. and I, yeah I, I hope we get more um a neurodivergent and queer neurodivergent queer people in academia as well right now i'm taking um online musical theater writing classes and i'm taking a music theory sort of course with an actor friend of mine and they are the first as far as i know queer and neurodivergent teacher that i've had like ever that's like both. Um, I've had queer, I've had a few. Openly queer. Openly, open, openly neurodivergent is the big thing. I've had a few mm -hmm. openly queer teachers before, mostly um, high school and college, um, but not until like post-college when I'm taking like classes for maybe an associate's degree and I get a teacher who is also a friend of mine, but is also just the first openly neurodivergent and queer teacher I've had is super cool. Um, yeah, when I was, when I was, um, for a class that I was TAing a couple of years ago, um, you know, we were at the beginning of the semester, we were asked to share a little bit about ourselves. And I was like, okay, what is it about, what can I say about me that's actually interesting? Oh, I'm autistic. Okay, I'll say that. So I kind of like offhandedly said, you know, um, I was diagnosed with Asperger's when I was three, I'm autistic. And that was kind of that mm -hmm. for me. But then after the class, I had like, three different students come up to me and say, hey, I'm autistic too, so thank you for like being open about it. And I was like, oh my God, like this, like people are actually impacted by that. And it was like something that I didn't even think about. So that's why whenever I'm teaching, I try to tell my students, if you've never met a queer neurodivergent person, congratulations, <laughs> now you have. I love that. I love that so much. It's it's really interesting in the past year since like I've started like having plays, having readings and whatnot. And since I joined New Play Exchange and my stuff is out there and I openly, you know, like have it in my bio. Like it's like the first thing on like all my bios and everything they're like hi I'm an actually autistic non-binary lesbian um like hi this is what I do um but in the past like two months already this year like between like January and April I've had two separate people dm me saying oh hey so my college acting teacher like we were reading your for Leonora in our class and I got to read it and this is the first time I felt seen by theater before so thank you for writing and like helping other students because I mostly write for younger audiences for the most part but like you know my my generation because I'm I am I'm 94 so I'm in, born 94 so I'm like I mean technically I'm a millennial but I feel closer to a zennial just because I mean I'm I'm on the autism spectrum so I tend to you know my hyper fixations and my interests tend to be often a little younger than my actual my actual 
age. So I am um, very aware of that. Um, and even though most of my internet friends are younger than me, now, most people don't realize I'm nearly 27 because I just am so ever <laughs> nice. And it's one of the big perks in a way of being autistic is that, I don't know, sometimes people either think you're really mature for your age or, you know, you're actually really, really youthful and like kind of in that sort of like middle zone of like, I, mean, I don't know, like, and it's kind of nice because as a non-binary person, it's like, wow, that's like kind of the ideal really because I'm not super young, I'm not super old and I'm just not really a gender. I'm just sort of here and I exist and it's cool and I feel really empowered by that. Um, I don't know. It's just... so strange how uh, you were mentioning about seeming or looking younger or older. When I was a child, I was considered uh like extremely mature, professorial. Mm -hmm. um, I got along better with adults. I never Same. got along with kids my own age. No, I, I only, too. I was friends. I was that kid who was friends, <laughs> was best friends with their teachers. Like Same. I'm, I'm, Me too. when I was in high school, really, really specifically, my, all my history teachers were like my best friends, which was. I, which I was, was an English teacher. I am a writer. I just write mm -hmm. nonfiction and I have a blog and stuff, but, uh, as far as representation goes, um, y'all are a little younger. I cannot tell you how vastly different my life, my adult life would have gone. I have not been uh, mentally stable until about four or five years ago um, after I finally got out of, um, you know, the criminal justice and rehab mm -hmm. system the last time. Um, but it's because I never saw myself. And if I saw vague and often insulting, insulting uh, representations of myself, that was negative. It taught me to hate myself mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can't see yourself, you can't know yourself. And uh, it just contributed to my general dysphoria with the rest of the world, you know? everybody knew I was different in these odd sort of vague undefinable ways but you know there was no name for it and because um of when I was born I was not diagnosed in childhood um because it just wasn't considered especially since the new science hadn't trickled down to the deep south and um I am I'm female, assigned female mm -hmm. at birth. Um, but otherwise, I was such a stereotypical little autistic boy. You know, it was just oh, yep. uh, very, I had boy interests. I was into dinosaurs <laughs> big time <laughs> and science fiction and trucks and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, just like being, learning to put on the mask uh, for a neurodivergency, you learn how to put on the, the mask on your gender too. Yeah, I mean, I when I was growing up, um, most of my it's funny um, still to this day. Like, yeah, I'm a lesbian, and I love I love women. I love you know, I love non-binary lesbians. I just it's it's interesting because so many of like my hyperfixations and social interests have been very you know male mask oriented, and like as someone who is I consider myself, I mean at least you know mask of center. Um, because I don't really consider myself really having a gender at all. I'm just very proudly androgynous. Um, but when I was a kid, like, yeah, I was big into dinosaurs, big into, like, you know, marine biology mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know, like, fantasy books and science fiction books. And uh, I played a lot of Pokemon. I still play a lot of Pokemon. Um, video games in general. Like, I said, big, weird Sonic the Hedgehog phase in middle school. Um, I, I mean, I'm, most of my friends were, like, I mean, I had, like, three, like, best friends who were girls, and they're still my best friends. Um, but so many of my friends growing up were, were boys. Um, and then, you know, once I figured out about sexuality and figured out I was, I was not really into guys, um, or at least figuring out slowly that I was not into guys, because, you know, trial and error. Um, but, um, by, by the time I fully figured out, you know, came into my own, figured out, you know, everything about my identity and my person, no, person who I am. Um, like it all really kind of clicks and makes sense. Like if I was looking back, like, oh wow, I had this hyperfixation on Alan Cumming. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Cause you know, I'm I'm super, super queer and you know, super androgynous. Um I just I definitely had a lot of those, you know, and I said I wasn't really I didn't even realize I was masking until, you know, I fully came into my own. Like I just sort of as I said, I was so oblivious treating social because I didn't know I was masking. I didn't know that 
you know, I was autistic and like, oh, after school, I'd go to like, you know, these like you know, social pragmatics groups and like, you know, have like specific like doctor, te- I don't know, they didn't know they're doctors, actually, you know, like you no know, therapist people who I like go to and talk to and like they talk to me about like social stuff. And I guess I play along, but I thought all kids in my generation did that. And then when I realized, no, wait, I just, that was just me. Like I knew it was in like one or two like classes in school that were specifically for like special needs kids. So it's like, yeah, cause I have eight, I have really bad ADHD. Okay. Um, but then once I fully was like, yeah, no, it's autism, it's Asperger's. I really hate using the term Asperger's, but at the time like, I was like, yeah, I have Asperger's. And then by the time I was like, no, by, by the time I was in college, like, yeah, no, I'm autistic. It's autism, it's autism. Don't be afraid to use the word. Um, because frankly, Asperger himself is not a very great person. So I prefer to just use autism. Um, it's just been really interesting to like chart that course of what things stayed the same and which things changed. Because there was a point like right before I fully came out as non-binary, I was super ultra, like maybe the most femme I'd ever been. Mm-hmm. 2017 was just a mistake. Really, It was actually, it was 2017. Like I was, my hair was the longest it'd ever been. Um, I was wearing dresses all the time to like, impress guy in relationship that I was in that was really toxic and gross but I was like wearing a lot of dresses I was just being very looking back I'm like wow that was such a mistake and that was like me like basically rebelling against how I really felt about myself and what I knew about myself deep down so by the time now that ended in 2018 happened I was like yeah no I'm gonna be my true self and everything just felt so much more comfortable. I was so confused for so long long. (laughs) I am I am pansexual Mm -hmm. and to me that means that when people filter potential partners, they'll usually run through the gender filter first. Is this person the gender I'm attracted to or not? But I've just never felt that way. Even from first grade, I got crushes on little girls and little boys and um, just, uh, but again, part of my masking was the path of least resistance, which meant I ended up dating a lot of bisexual men and closeted trans women, you know, <laughs> and it's just hilarious looking back on that and going, oh, I was always in queer relationships. I, you know? yeah, relationships, yeah, <laughs> relationships are, are always very tricky because I was so desperate and like once I figured out, you know, sexuality stuff like for like until maybe like I realized I liked women when I was um 14, um, my first trip to New York to see theater, I saw Laura Benanti and Gypsy, and I didn't even know, I didn't know what stripping or burlesque was, so this is the first Broadway show I see, and it's literally, Laura Benanti is, is, you know, is a burlesque artist, and I'm just like, who are you? You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in the world, but I'm like, you know, Tanty Slings Downs, I'm seeing Daniel Radcliffe and Equus tomorrow, and so, and I saw it, and I was like, yeah, no, Daniel Radcliffe, a lot of them, make it yeah. with the okay, and like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, sure, yeah, he's a great actor, and I was like, kind of very unfazed by everything, so it's like really interesting, like chart, like, yeah. So I figured out I did, I wasn't super into men, but the thing is comp head, uh, um, compulsory heterosexuality pretty much dominated my life until, mm. until at least, you know, my mid twenties. I mean, I, about, I mean, right before my mid twenties, really like early, early, early twenties, really. Um, so once I, you know, after, you know, multiple relationships with men that just were not great, one was good, but like we broke up on completely mutual terms and then other men were just mistakes. But then by the time I was like, yeah, no, I, I love, I, I love women. And I just felt really comfortable with that. I mean, I'm still, I consider myself pan romantic because I have romantic feelings for so many people. And like, it can be between, you know, it's just because I have a love, lots of love for us. I'm also polyamorous. Um, I'm in an open relationship with my girlfriend of five plus years. Um, I mean, I'm just very open about like, my sexuality and stuff. And I did and I better think- with, uh, uh, like I did better with open relationships. My most mm-hmm. successful ones were open relationships yeah. because I felt like that took, I was at the sole focus of another yeah. person and it would take up all my spoons and I couldn't be mm-hmm. everything to one person because yeah. I could barely take care of myself. You know, yeah. my open relationship with my main partner, like still felt, you know, solid and secure. And just, I mean, it's interesting to just, you know, I mean, it's always different things are constantly changing. I mean, I'm still, it's still open relationship and it's wonderful. Um, you know, I see pandemics make things harder to like, you know, try to find more people, you know, pursue more people to, you know, not really pursue. I was like, just starting to get out there again. Exactly. It's like me. <laughs> finish came along and I was just like, no. Like I'm done I'm with college. I can go, I can go to, I can go to the cubby hole like whenever <laughs> I want. Cause like I've, I've, I've never got, I never got to go to the cubby hole. which is a famous lesbian bar in New York. And like, finally I can go here. And it's like, nope, pandemic. Sorry. I met my regrettable ex, who's a male, at the cubby hole. 
talk about irony. And for me, it was like, my dating life wasn't exactly great before the pandemic hit. So when it did, I was like, what's changed, y'all? Yeah, it's, it's um, been really interesting to process, like, because my play, um, God of the is so much about um, relationships and quarantine and polyamory and touch starvation and, you know, long distance relationships. And I mean, as I say, like one of the main characters is like autistic and is into polyamory and is in, you know, a, uh, it first starts out to play in a long distance relationship that's like made long distance because of the pandemic. And then, you know, we'll just have to read the play to find out. Love in the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty, <laughs> Pretty much. much. Pretty well, much. We are, well, hopefully, um, with, well, Damon, Haley, with people like you, you give all of us a lot of hope for the future of LGBTQ plus slash disabled slash neurodivergent representation. I just want to thank you both so much for your time and for your words and for your wisdom. And I want to thank Spectrum Theater Ensemble for hosting us. And, and um, I want to wish you all a great day. Thanks Bye. For having us. Thank you for having me. Of course.